Jake and I have been taking a little turn, reading a little scripture to uh, start the service. That scripture that's tied to the pastor's uh, pastor's uh, sermon. And um, this morning we're reading from Mark, um, and um, um, I will. Uh, I'm, I'm tempted to show, you know, I'll read from uh, the book of uh, James Cleveland, the Angelic Gospel Choir, but I will not do that. <laughs> and, uh, and the same day, when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat upon the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose, and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and sea obey him? Here, keep our focus, place our eyes on Jesus all year long. I hope when we come together that we will keep our eyes on Jesus. And part of the way we do that is in the communion. We do it every week just to remind us that we serve a Lord, a Lord who's saving us, a Lord who did everything for us. Servers, if you'll take your places, uh, find a server close to you, uh, take them, please, and hang on to those, and uh, we'll eat and drink together here in just a moment. Brother Walt, one of our elders, will lead us in prayer. It was Jesus Christ who said, Eat and drink in remembrance of me. It was Jesus who said that we be one in him, according to the Holy Scriptures. It was Jesus Christ who was the resurrection and the life. Absolutely. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness, for your amazing grace. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for our brothers and our sisters. We thank you for our visitors. We know, Father, that the Bible says one day we will see you in heaven. Surrounded by your glory, Father, what a victory that we have through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What it is a blessing. It is to be with our brothers and sisters. And we just honor it all to you, Father. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mace is reading from Mark chapter 4 to kind of get our time started together. And when you look at Mark chapter 4, it's an interesting study you you get into a study like this and you need to stop and think because what Jesus is introducing is not just a new day but a new start when I open up the gospels I got to, now I'm going to kind of envision the way I see things when I see the authors now here's Matthew, he's writing this gospel in Mark. Matthew to me is one of these uh, very formal, dignified type guys. And he is very precise in what he says. And he identifies the Jewish uh, genealogy of Jesus. You get into Mark. Mark is the youngest of the four writers about the the life of Jesus. 
And, and Mark isn't concerned about the genealogies. He's kind of a bottom line type guy that says, here's the bottom line. You get into Luke's account, and Luke's a scholar here of the four that write about the life of Jesus. Luke is very precise in words that he chooses. Um, it, it's always interesting in, in the, the original language of the New Testament. Uh, there's more than one word that we can translate needle. And at one point, Matthew tells a story and uses the word needle. Luke, when he comes along and uses the word Nito telling the same story. The difference in the change that takes place there gives you a different view. And then you, you get into the last of the four Gospels, John. And John's the old man of the group. John doesn't write the Gospel of John until some 60 years after the cross. And so when John writes, he's, he's writing from a a more of an emotional standpoint. I knew Jesus. He's the last living apostle. So when you, when you get into a study like this of Mark, you've got to keep in mind, Mark is full of fire. He energizes. He cuts through and he says, I don't have time to tell you about the genealogy. I don't have time to tell you every little detail. But let me tell you this story. And in chapter 4, he, he tells a story that took Matthew three chapters to tell you. Mark tells a story of what we refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. It's really not so much that Mark says, here's the Sermon on the Mount, but it's the same type of information. And he, he brings it down and says, look, here, let me tell you this story about Jesus and he says here's Jesus talking to everyone and telling them what's going on by the time it's over Jesus is tired he's been teaching for a lengthy period of time not just for a few verses but for a lengthy period of time the crowds have been immense so he Jesus says, let's cross over to the other side of the sea. So they get in a boat. Jesus quickly falls asleep. Speaks of, a, of someone who understands his purpose. Someone who falls asleep knowing I have done what I need to do. It's, it's one who speaks out and says, I want you to taste the sweet wine of success. So here's Jesus sleeping. Not because of anything more than he's reached that point physically. He's done everything he needs to do for this moment, this day, and time. But get out on the sea. Storm comes up. Mark's telling you the story of how the storm comes up. Matthew will tell you the story also. The storm must be one that's quite vicious. <coughs> Because you're dealing with at least part of the disciples who know how to run the boat, how to sail, how to go from shore to shore. So they face this storm. They're fighting the storm. And, and as, at least from what I can gather, they, been, they did it for several hours. Sea of Galilee had storms that came up very rapidly, very severely sometimes lasting a short time, sometimes for a few hours. And so they're facing this storm. And they're fighting it. It's all hands on deck. Jesus is asleep. You know how you feel when you're pressured to get something done. You got to get it done. You're under a timetable. You're under what has to be accomplished. And then all of a sudden you look around and someone's not doing the job. And that's kind of why they saw Jesus right here. Because the first thing that comes out of their mouth is, Lord, don't you care what's going on? Well, Jesus wasn't a sailor. Jesus was not one 
that owned a boat. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they were all fishermen. They owned boats. They were professionals at what they were doing. Jesus was not a sailor. He was here as the rabbi. He was here to be the savior. He was here to be our eternal sacrifice. Don't you care? Yeah, Jesus cares. But he's exhausted. He experienced everything that we experience. He faced temptation as we face temptation. He, fa he faced the same thing we do when we're hungry. Our stomachs are growling. He faced the same thing we do when we get tired and sleepy. We yawn. Jesus faced everything that we face. He's in human form. He's tired. He's worn out. Don't you care? Yes, I care. But Jesus doesn't get out of the bed and become a defensive one. He doesn't immediately get up and says, what's the matter with, with you guys? Don't you understand what I've been doing? There's no defense there. He doesn't deal with it at all. He just turns to the sea. He says, peace be still. Or I used a more modern term. I kind of like this. He looks at the sea and says, cool it. <laughs> Calm down. Be still. That's enough. That's amazing that, that he'd do that. He's already done amazing things, but right now it's amazing that he could speak and the sea immediately became calm. Then he addresses the real issue. The real issue is, well, let's skip forward three years. Jesus is getting ready to ascend. And he says to his followers, I will be with you always. And he's been, he's been saying to them, here I am, I'm with you, I'm going with you. What are they afraid of? They're facing a storm. We all have fears, we all face struggles in life. He's facing storm. Whether the disciples are facing storms. But Jesus is there. Jesus demonstrates no fear. He is able to sleep in the midst of a storm. Why? Because he says, I've come to do my Father's will, not mine. I'm here. I have something to do, and I am accomplishing it. There's an internal peace. It's, it's what Paul writes about when he talks about peace that passes understanding. Jesus had that type of peace. Why are you so afraid? And then he really gets to the bottom line. Where's your faith? Do you trust me? Don't you know that I'm here? Well, they get to, and now we're skipping to chapter 5. Remember, this is a letter. There's no, there's no chapters and verses. Paul, or Mark, is writing a letter. He's describing what, what he knows about. And most likely... A lot of what he knows comes from the relationship he had with the Apostle Peter. So he's recounting what he's heard and what he knows. And of course, bottom line here is that the Holy Spirit's guiding him. So I don't have any fear about what he's saying. But he says, they reach the other side, they arrive at the other side. They've gone from a storm to a peaceful Arriving at the beach. Pull a boat up. Tie it up. They get out. First thing they see is the cemetery. Lauren and I were traveling over the, uh, the holidays, the Christmas holidays. And, and we had gone to uh, a, a spot that uh, our son wanted us to go visit. And so when we arrive in town, and it's a place actually that uh, Lauren and I were at in the late 60s. It's a place where I had preached in the past. And when you first arrive in town on, on one of the main roads, the first thing you come to is the cemetery. Uh, there are a lot of communities like that scattered across our country. When you take the main road into town, you see a cemetery. And, and as the towns grow, 
They kind of grow around the cemetery. And what once used to be out of town is now a part of town. And so as we came into the community of, of some, I don't remember, maybe 20,000, 25,000, there was the cemetery. Jesus arrives. They get out of the boat. First thing I got to do is walk through the cemetery. Where are they going? To the village, to the community, to the township. And they walk through the cemetery. Problem is, there's a guy living in the cemetery. There are probably places here in Dayton, street corners that you avoid. Why? Because there's somebody there holding a sign up saying, I'm homeless. Can you spare a buck or two? There are places that really grab our attention. This is one of those times, not so much that someone's saying I'm homeless, but he is saying, I live in this cemetery. And he runs around unclothed. There's a lot of things going on in this man's life. Mark identifies it, that he's full of evil. Or maybe a more familiar term to you, full of demons. Jesus does not avoid going to the cemetery. He goes into the cemetery. He uses the power that only Jesus has. Heals the man. But there are a couple thousand pigs there. And for whatever reason, and maybe it becomes obvious to us when we step back and look at the whole story of why. But he chooses the pigs. Jesus has not come to save pigs. He's come to save each person. The greatest of all God's creation. He sends the evil, the demons into the pigs. They run over a cliff and fall into the sea and drown. Immediately, people are shouting at Jesus. You need to leave our community. We don't want you here. You cost us too much money. Sometimes we're more concerned about what's around us, what we have, what we see, than we are about the people that we come in contact with. Jesus saw one guy that needed the help that Jesus could give, and he gave him the help. The community saw him as someone to fear. They shied away. And when they lost all their pigs, they immediately are upset. They have found a man fully clothed, setting down for the first time, calm, peace. Peace be still. And they find a man very still, very quiet. And the first thing they say is, nah, we're more concerned about the pigs. We're more concerned about what's around us than we are about another human being. So they tell Jesus, leave. You find Jesus doesn't make any opposition to it. If that's what you want, I will do it. Calls his disciples together. They get back in a boat and they take off again. They go back out onto the sea that Jesus had calmed. As they go back, as they get ready to board the boat, the man has been healed, comes to Jesus, says, take me with you. <laughs> Why wouldn't you want to go? Does anyone care that you are now at peace? Does anyone care that you're now healed? Does anyone care that, that now what once troubled you has been totally removed and you are a whole new person? Do you even care? He looked around and said, I don't want to be in this community anymore. Now here's, here's where you got to think for a moment. Jesus so many times when things would happen, he would turn to his disciples and said, okay, I've done this. This is what I've done. Now, be quiet. I don't need you telling anyone. There were times that he did miracles that the people would get so excited. And Jesus would say, I don't need you 
talking about this miracle. But this time, he says to the man, I want you to stay here and I want you to tell everyone about what's happened. Now the unique part of this story, this is kind of the, the, one of those sayings, you know, this is the rest of the story. In a couple of chapters, Jesus is going to return to the area of the ten cities. And this is what this area was known as. When he comes back, the crowds meet him. But not to ask him to leave. But the crowds meet him and ask for him to heal and to be with them. They've asked him to leave. And he leaves one person behind. And says, you've got one thing to do, just tell your story. That's all I need you to do. In Mark's gospel, this was the exception to when Jesus did anything else. This man was the exception. Now that opens up some other doors for us. It begins to explain to us how Jesus reaches out to each one of us. But there are three things I want you to take with you this morning. Here are the three. First is, always remember Jesus cares. You may not understand it at the moment. You may be in a boat taking on water in the midst of a storm. And you can use that in any image that you want. But there is someone available that cares. And that's Jesus. Jesus. I don't care what you're facing. At the moment you're facing it, you may, you may be crying out. You may be struggling. You may be angry. You may be upset. You can cry out like we do, all of us do from time to time. Why me, Lord? Let me tell you who you can do this to, but not me, Lord. We feel so many things. But always know and in the midst of every struggle that you face, there is a Lord that cares. Whether it's on a ship or whether it's in a cemetery, our Lord cares. Second, Jesus always takes action. And this is where I want you to see the full story of the man when Jesus says, stay here and tell the story. Jesus is taking action. Action that is not what so many commentaries will look at and think of and say, well, you know, Jesus did the unusual here. What he did, he wanted to reach this area called Ten Cities with his message. He could leave a disciple, but they could say, well, you know, that's just because you're a friend of Jesus. Or he could have somebody stay behind that everybody knew and everybody had seen the change in his life and he could say, tell the story. You see, when Jesus takes action, it's the action that needs to be taken. When he calmed the sea, it was the action that needed to be taken because of the disciples and all the struggle they're going through at that moment. Jesus, why are you asleep? Why aren't you, here Jesus, here's a pail. Why aren't you bail us out? Or here Jesus, here's a line to the sail. Why don't you let down the sail? Why aren't you doing something, Jesus? And Jesus does exactly what they couldn't do. He calmed the sea. They wanted action, but they wanted him to take care of the sail or to take care of the water in the bottom of the boat. But Jesus understood there was a greater thing that needed to happen and that it was to understand, I am greater than the sea. And then he takes action with this man. He could have said to the man, yes, you want to be one of my disciples? Come on, get in the boat and go with us. And Jesus told him what he didn't want to hear. That is, you stay here and tell the story. Now that had to be tough to do. But because he did, things happened. He did what Jesus had asked him to do. Which brings us to our response. So often our response. For the disciples, their response was, 
never seen anything like this in my life. It was a response of one taking stock of where they are, thinking through what's taking place, wanting to, to know more. Sometimes our response needs to be, I need to grasp this a little better. For the man, he had not heard the Sermon on the Mount of Mark chapter 4. He had not seen anything other than what Jesus did in his life. His context of this action is all about a moment in time when Jesus said, Be whole, be at peace, be healed. Nothing more. It wasn't about great wisdom and knowledge. It was about saying, I know who did this. It's Jesus and I will glorify him. It's Jesus and I will honor him in the midst of all that's gone on. You see, our response is never the same from each of us. We're not identical. We've all been made in the image of God, but to each of us, we have been blessed in unique ways. And Jesus cares about each one of us in whatever situation we're in. Jesus is going to take the appropriate action in whatever situation that we're in. Our response ought to be, yes, Lord, here am I. I love you. That's where it all begins. Not complicated. It's not how much you know. It is about a response, though, to the Jesus that says, I love you, and I will take action. Come follow me. Not like everybody is doing, but as I have gifted you, come follow me. See, it's about waking up and understanding, this is the way I've been blessed, and this is how I can best respond to my God. And I hope you'll do that this year. I hope you'll take this new year, and I realize we haven't met for a couple of weeks, but I hope you'll realize that there may be some more times this year that we won't meet, but that's okay. It isn't about so much how many times we meet. It's about our response to our Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You want me to stay? Okay. You want me to get in the boat? Okay. It's about us understanding we have been blessed to follow the Lord.